Um, welcome students, staff, faculty, community members, and distinguished guests. My name is Priyanka Zaman, and I am a fourth year undergraduate student here at Stony Brook University. I would like to thank everyone who was able to make it today um, under the Provost Lecture Series. I would also like to thank all who has helped us um, at the Provost Office, as well as Provost Dan Dennis Asanis, who unfortunately was not able to attend this lecture. Um, also, special thanks to those who have supported us for this lecture. Um, the Career Center, the Department of Sociology, the Department of Political Science, the Jewish Foundation of the Education of Women, the Stony Brook Institute of Global Studies, Women in Science and Engineering, and Girls Learn International at SBU. The reason that I'm speaking to you is because I am the president of Girls Learn International here at Stony Brook. GLI is a nonprofit organization which advocates both gender equality as well as the importance of education provided to girls and women in underdeveloped nations. More specifically, Girls Learn gives the opportunity for American students to take part in establishing this mission throughout direct connections with girls attending these schools. This club not only builds skills in leadership and dedication for, these mem for our members, but also helps build the way for the future of all these young women. It is for this reason that our club thought it was fitting to bring Ambassador Chaudhary, who has dedicated his life to promote women's participation in communities and build sustainable peace. I will now hand over the mic to Dr. Schaefer, who will now introduce the speaker. I would like to welcome you all to this event. Uh, as you just heard, uh, there are six co-sponsors uh, for this event, which means there's widespread interest. That is wonderful. We really appreciate it that you were all coming. Now, um, there were two groups that were initially uh, responsible for this invitation, and uh, you just heard about Girls Who Just Learn International, and I would like to add a few words about WISE, which is a wonderful acronym standing for Women in Science and Engineering. Um, the mission of Women in Science and Engineering is to attract and retain academically talented and motivated women uh, of diverse backgrounds. WISE is a national program that is recognized for its leadership in producing highly skilled women prepared to pursue careers in science, mathematics, and engineering. WISE builds community by mentoring and supporting its students academically, socially, and through giving scholarships and by having 100% participation in research in the freshman year and, as, and continued research and internships through the four years at Stony Brook. WISE has created a more diverse classroom for SBU students especially in the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and helped women, women going into and finishing degrees in these very STEM fields. Now let me introduce our distinguished speaker, Ambassador Anwarul Shadhuri. Uh, distinguished indeed. Ambassador Shadhuri served from 2002 to 2007 as the Under Secretary General and High Representative of the United Nations responsible for the most vulnerable countries of the world. A career diplomat, he served as Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations in Europe from 1996 <coughs> to 2001. He also served as Bangladesh Ambassador to Chile, Nicaragua, Peru, and Venezuela, as well as Bangladesh High Commissioner to the Bahamas and Guyana. He served as President of the Security Council, President of the United Nations Children's Fund, Executive Board, Vice President of the Economic and Social Council of the UN for two terms, and Chairman of the UN General Assembly's Administrative and Budgetary Committee. Ambassador Shautou is bareheaded a pioneering initiative of the United Nations General Assembly in 1999 for adoption of the landmark declaration and program 
on action on a culture of peace and proclamation of the International Decade, Decade for Culture of Peace and Nonviolence for the Children of the World. His initiative in March 2000 as the President of the Security Council led to the adoption of the groundbreaking UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women and peace and security. He is the recipient of the UTAN Peace Award, UNESCO Gandhi Gold Medal for Culture of Peace and Spirit of the UN Award. In March 2003, the Soka University of Tokyo, Japan, conferred to Ambassador Shatou an honorary doctorate for his work on women's issues, child rights, and culture of peace, as well as for the strengthening of the United Nations. He is the chair of the International Day of Peace NGO Committee of, at the UN New York and chairman of the Global Forum on Human Settlements, both since 2008. Dr. Shakuri will now speak on women, essential for peace and security. Good evening to all of you. I hope you can hear me now. The mic is on, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Schaefer, for that wonderful introduction. Very gracious of you. And I thank the, the president of the Girls Learn International for her welcoming comments, and uh, I am so appreciative that she is actively involved in this organization promoting equality of women. And Dr. Schaefer mentioned about uh, WISE, and uh, I recall that in, as uh, the, now the president of Girls Learn International, Priyanka, who applied and got uh, support from the WISE Fund to come for our studies here. So I'm deeply appreciative of that. Did you know that we take more than 21,000 breaths a day? Amazing, isn't it? But more amazing is that most of us use only 50% of our lung capacity. Think what would happen to our bodies, minds, and spirits if we could access the other 50%. The same is true about world's seven billion people. Our planet would be much healthier, more productive, safer, and more secure if we are inclusive of the other 50% of the population. You know I'm referring to the women of the world. Our planet is in urgent need of breathing into its optimal wellness by ensuring equality between women and men. I'm delighted to be invited to speak at the Provost's lecture series at the Stony Brook University. A vibrant Stony Brook community is well known, and I'm very happy that this highly recognized institution, particularly for its innovation and energy and vibrancy. I believe that this lecture series or people like me who come here to speak on subject not maybe directly related to science and technology and engineering, 
but it builds, I think, or rather it broadens the horizon of the students here and it brings in extra element which will prepare them well for life. Let me at this point especially thank all of you for joining me at this rain-soaked afternoon. Uh, my speech will be, as Dr. Schaefer mentioned, women essential for sustainable peace. And I am very happy that a um, number of organizations or institutions have joined together uh, to be sponsoring this event, the Career International, the Department of Sociology, the Department of Political Science, the Jewish Foundation for the Education of Women, the Stony Brook Institute of Global Studies, of course, Women in Science and Engineering, and of course, the Girls Learn International at Stony Brook University. I will be discussing the intrinsic role of women in peace and security, along with the genesis and follow-up of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325. I'll come a little bit later to tell what this resolution signifies. In the opening page of her remarkably forward-looking book, 60 Years, 60 Voices, Israeli and Palestinian Women, Patricia Smith Melton writes poignantly asserting women's empowerment. And she, I, and I quote her, <clears throat> she is rising to herself, to the people's astonishment. She has placed her future in her hands and is ready to drink from the cup of it. End of quote. Though her book brings out wonderfully the inner quest and energy of Palestinian and Israeli women for sustainable peace in their countries and their region, Patricia underlines that this book is for all women everywhere. The context of my recent contribution to a special issue of the Palestine-Israel Journal is also the same. Despite all the diversity generated by a variety of reasons, the quest for peace remains eternal and universal. The contribution and involvement of women in this is an inherent reality that transcends everything. And it prompted me to take a much awaited step when the opportunities opportunity presented itself. I will come to that later. Peace is a prerequisite for human development. A lasting peace cannot be achieved without the participation of women and the inclusion of gender perspectives in peace processes. It has been said, for generations, women have served as peace educators, both in their families and in their societies. They have proved instrumental in building bridges rather than walls. When women participate in peace negotiations and in the crafting of a peace agreement. They keep the future of their societies, their communities in mind. They think of how their children and grandchildren will live in their country, how they will benefit from the peace agreement in a sustainable way. They have the greater and longer term interest of society in mind. Whereas historically in the post-conflict situations, men are interested in ensuring that following the peace agreement, 
they will retain authority and power in the government or in the cabinet or in any other power structure. The International Women's Day in the year 2000 was an extraordinary day for me and will remain so for the rest of my life. That day, I had the honor of issuing on behalf of the United Nations Security Council in my capacity as its president, a statement that formally brought to global attention the unrecognized underutilized and undervalued contribution women have been making towards the prevention of wars, peace building, and engaging individuals and societies to live in harmony. The members of the Security Council recognized that peace is inextricably linked with the equality between women and men, and affirmed the equal access and full participation of women in power structures, and their full involvement in all efforts for peace and security. If one looks into the relevance of the content, potential for change, and expected impact of any global declaration for women, two of them stand out head and shoulders above all others. The first is the Beijing Platform for, for Action, adopted at the Fourth World Conference on Women in 1995. And the second is the UN Security Council Resolution 1325. They are unparalleled in terms of what they can do to empower women, not only to give the 50% of the world's population their due, but also to make the world a better place to live. And these two events are complementary to each other. The, the Beijing was the, the last occasion when the, a global women's summit was held nearly 20 years ago in 1995. And now there is a serious discussion whether to convene a fifth world conference on women on the 20th anniversary of the Beijing Conference. And five hours after the Beijing, the Security Council resolution was adopted, focusing on women's role in peace and security areas, which was absent from the agenda of the Security Council for 55 years of its existence in, in that year. For a long time, the impression has been that women were helpless victims of wars and conflicts. The role of women in fostering peace in their communities and beyond has often been overlooked. That inexplicable 55 years long silence was broken for the first time on 8th of March 2000. And as you know, March 8th has been declared by the United Nations as the International Women's Day. So that was the objective that um, I proposed on that occasion, the statement on behalf of the Security Council to recognize the special role of women to promote peace and security. That is one when the, the seeds of the resolution 1325 was sown. The formal resolution followed this conceptual and political breakthrough in October of the same year, after nearly eight months of persistent efforts through the Council's unanimous agreement to give this issue the attention and recognition that it deserved. To me and many others, the key element of 1325 has, from the outset, been participation 
in which women can contribute equally at all levels of decision making and ultimately help shape societies where violence and inequality experienced by women would not be the norm. The Security Council should realize that women are not just a vulnerable group, they are empowering as well. We need to remember that the main emphasis here as peace and human rights activist Cora Weiss often asserts is not to make war safe for women, but to structure the peace in a way that there is no recurrence of war and conflict. That is why women need to be at the peace tables. Women need to be involved in decision making and in peacekeeping teams, particularly as civilians, to make a real difference in transitioning from the cult of war to the culture of peace. Resolution 1325 marked the first time that such a proposition was recognized as an objective of the Security Council. As such, its implementation places a unique and all-embracing responsibility on the international community, particularly the United Nations. It is amazing that in only 11 years since its adoption in 2000, just four numbers, one, three, two, five, have generated a global enthusiasm that is unprecedented. The adoption of the Resolution 1325, let me say, the Security Council resolutions are serial numbered. So from day one, we have reached now, of course, we are adopting nearly 1971 or 1981 number of the resolution. So 1325 was on October 2000. So that is why the people do not mention or refer it as a Security Council resolution anymore. They just mention 1325. And people understand what it means, what it signifies, and particularly civil society organizations are very charged up the moment they hear 1325. The adoption of that resolution opened a much-awaited door of opportunity for women who have shown time and again that they bring a qualitative improvement in peace structuring and post-conflict planning. You know who received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011. Three women, two from Africa and one from the Arab world, from Liberia and Yemen. They received the world's most highly recognized honor. Like many, I am very encouraged that in choosing the three women laureates, the citation of the Nobel Committee referred to Resolution 1325, saying that, and I quote, it underlined the need for women to become participants on an equal footing with men in peace processes and in peace work in general, end of quote. The Nobel Committee further asserted that, and I quote again, we cannot achieve democracy and lasting peace in the world unless women obtain the same opportunities as men to influence developments at all levels of society, end of quote. This is the first time when a Nobel Peace Prize citation has mentioned a United Nations resolution so specifically. I'm often asked how the concept behind Resolution 1325 came to be placed on the agenda of the Security Council for the first time. It was during Bangladesh's presidency of the Council, my conviction and determination to steer that initiative grew out of my close and long-standing engagement with the international women's agenda. 
This agenda effectively came up in my interaction over the years with the NGO community, and I felt this needed a boost in the Security Council's work, in which the undeniable link between women's equality and peace would be asserted. The dynamics of global war and security strategy as it was evolving in a post-war world, prompting the United Nations General Assembly to adapt a program of action on culture of peace, which I also had the privilege of steering, prepared the ground for raising the issue of equality. At the beginning of March, when Security Council's president submits the monthly work plan, I indicated my intention to proceed with this agenda. When I first brought up the issue of women and peace and security, some of my colleagues expressed wide-ranging disinterest, even indifference, saying that the president was diluting the councils, meaning the Security Council's mandate, by trying to bring in a soft issue of onto its agenda. The five permanent members of the Security Council resisted stubbornly through procedural and substantive maneuvers, expecting that this newcomer in the Council, Bangladesh, became a member of the Security Council in January of that year, and this was happening in March, would not be able to sustain its enthusiasm against this long-standing bastion of power. Conceptually, it seemed they decided not to connect women, peace, and security. I had originally hoped that the outcome would be a Security Council resolution, but it turned out not to be possible in the time available due to these objections by some high-profile member states. In that situation, we settled for a presidential statement, which also remained elusive. Finally, I coaxed all 15 members of the Security Council to issue a unanimously agreed upon statement by the Council. And that is what was issued in, on 8th of March as a conceptual breakthrough. The historic and operational value of the resolution, which was adopted after eight months from March to October. October 31st was the day when this resolution 1325 was adopted by the Security Council by consensus, and it was done under the chairmanship or presidency of Namibia. The historic and operational value of the resolution as the first international policy mechanism that explicitly recognized the gendered nature of war and peace processes has been undercut by the not so encouraging record of its implementation. As you know, the, all the Security Council resolutions are mandatory on the member states uh, of the United Nations, and uh, even to extend that, I can say that it, it applies to all individuals uh, living uh, or whose countries are at least members of the UN, even if they are not member. Like now, we, Security Council is imposing sanctions, which comes uh, or applies to even a private citizen of the world. Because if you are having business, with a country under sanctions, you are liable to be convicted for violating Security Council resolution. So we thought with this strong mandate uh, behind this concept of recognizing the or giving the due equal share to women in the decision making, we will have a lot of quick progress, but the progress is very slow and not always very encouraging. The existing international practices that make women in SICO and deny their equality of participation basically as a result of its support 
of the existing militarized interstate security arrangements is disappointing. The existing concept of security based on interstate power structure rather than on human security, security of the people, is being referred to here. The human security is not a primary consideration in the Security Council's decision-making process. Also, we should keep in mind that the Security Council itself, despite all those follow-up resolutions, is yet to internalize gender considerations into the operational behavior of its actions. A survey in 2010 found that worldwide, women still make up less than 20% of the signatories of the peace agreements, and only 7% of the peace negotiators globally. It is true that it took nearly five years of advocacy by women to get Burundi women included in the peace table when the Burundi peace process was going on. Um, uh, it took uh, five years for women to get them a place at the peace table. And that was also done at the 11th hour. And also that was possible only because the, the person looking over the peace process on behalf of the United Nations was no other than Nelson Mandela. And this story I recall all the time when President Mandela came to brief us in the Security Council. He was telling that men would resist bringing women in to share the table with them. And he said, I found that they have a lot of, so women would come in the evening after the formal meetings are over, they will come, chat with me, sort of share stories, have a cup of tea. And he said, I got many nice ideas from them. And in the morning, I would share that with the men. And they all would say, yes, these are good things. So at one point, he said that I told them that these are the ideas we get from these women who are, you are trying to uh, you know, keep away. Why not bring them over? Listen, let us listen from them directly. Why through me? And that is why it, I mentioned in my speech, at the 11th hour, they were brought in. And it, it was amazing that this, this thing worked very well by ensuring a longer term um, uh, uh, sustainability of the peace process in Burundi. And Burundi is now doing well. I do not know how many of you have seen this five-part series of films called Women, War, and Peace, which was shown, I think, two, three months ago in the PBS. And uh, this is a series prepared by our um, good collaborator, Abigail Disney. And this records very effectively how women have in, been involved in peace processes in various parts of the world. And one story very effectively shown in that uh, series is the, the role played by Lema Boy, who was one of the Liberian women, women who got the Nobel Peace Prize. She and her women supporters, all the leaders of the three West African countries, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, were together negotiating the peace process. And the women surrounded the um, conference center and said, until and unless you agree on a peace agreement, we'll not let you go out of the building. And they sat there, and it worked. And <coughs> this is remarkable, because they said, our children, our families are suffering. And you are negotiating agreement who will be, will be having more power over the other. And that is not we are going to tolerate. So that, that happened. And it's remarkable if you get, <coughs> can get the university, maybe 
getting this series and you can see it uh, here. We need to remember also that women are the worst victim as more governments have become less accountable to the people abusing democratic values. Universal norms and standards are being ignored and sidestepped and risks are being borne by those who had no role in taking them. One important point to remember that women had least role in the decision making to go to a war. But when war happens, they are the worst victims. So this is the, a very important point that women should take up very, very strongly. Further, the fragmented global governance has led to missing the big picture and addressing symptoms, not causes. At the same time, militarism is impoverishing and maiming both the earth and humanity. Closely related to these are the energizing and history-making phenomena of the Arab awakening that we are watching from the margins. But at the same time, as has been reported by the International Civil Society Action Network in its eye-opening report on the Arab Spring and its implications for women, and I agree wholeheartedly with the report when it says, and I quote, women in the region are experiencing the good, the bad, and the ugly that comes with instability, transition, and crisis. From Tunisia and Egypt to Syria, Libya, and Bahrain, women have been present and vocal in the street protest movements standing shoulder to shoulder with men, resisting the batons and tear gas, and being killed. Women not only joined, but many initiated the nonviolent struggles for democracy. Many have been key organizers and leaders in social networking, helping to articulate a common message and vision, vision of freedom democracy, and equality, and providing logistical support to men at the front lines of violence. They have also faced many of the same physical and sexual threats and risks that women elsewhere have encountered during the crisis and transitions, including harassment, assault, and death. Despite their contribution, they are again facing exclusion from the political process underway. The report also added, reflecting the concern of many, that by omission or commission, the emerging male-dominated leaderships seem to forget that democracy without equality in all aspects of the law and full participation of the 50% of the population is another form of authoritarianism. I strongly believe that Resolution 1325 is not the end, but the beginning of the processes that will gradually help reduce and eliminate inequalities. A major concern emerging from the various studies is that themes most frequently referenced in resolutions by the Security Council tend to refer to women as victims rather than as active agents in the peace building process, such as governance, peace negotiations, and post-conflict nation building. My own experience during the course of my different responsibilities, more so during the past 20 plus years has shown that participation of women in peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peace building assures 
that their experiences, priorities, and solutions contribute to stability, including governance and sustainable peace. When you ask me what needs to be done, I would underscore the need to ensure an effective, real, and faithful implementation of 1325 in letter and spirit. But how to do that? For that, I believe top priority should be given to energizing and supporting the UN member states to prepare their respective national plan of action for 1325 at the country level. Security Council resolution subsequently have asked each country, each member of the United Nations, to prepare a national action plan to tell how they want to implement what the Security Council has decided, particularly giving women equal access at all decision-making levels. I think participation, we sometimes in our discourse, we say Resolution 1325 emphasized three Ps, protection, prevention, and then the most important, participation. So that is what comes out of this National Action Plan. How are you planning to give equal access and equality to women in the decision-making levels? So that is the key. So that is why I believe that, let me then mention what I'm saying here, of 193 UN members, so far only 34 have prepared such plans, and 10 more are on the way. And it is the 12th year after adoption of the resolution. A long way to go for other countries. Now that, and you know that, I, I believe you know, that the United Nations in 2010 decided to merge all its bodies and entities and units dealing with women into a big agency and women's entity called UN Women. And that entity has all the authority under the UN system to promote 1325, and it has taken up uh, 1325 as a priority item. So I believe that now this has been done. This entity has the responsibility to work with the countries, the remaining countries, suggesting a time frame to have the plans ready and to get the UN resident coordinators to follow up on that. Each developing country has a resident coordinator from the UN system appointed by the Secretary General of the United Nations. He or she is the person who is the representative of the United Nations in the country. And he or she speaks on behalf of the Secretary General of the United Nations. And I believe that if the resident coordinator takes up with the government's concern to focus on preparation of the National Action Plan, and preparation not only by the government, through, through a full consultative process involving civil society, academics, research organizations, media, and everybody, educational institutions, of course, the government functionaries. In real terms, the National Action Plan is the engine that would speed up the implementation of Resolution 1325. It should be also emphasized that all countries are obligated, as I said earlier, as per decisions of the Security Council, to prepare the National Plan whether they are in a conflict situation or not. Next, I would say that special attention should be given to the promotion of awareness and sensitivity and training of the senior officials of the United Nations system as a whole with regard to Resolution 1325. 
there is a big gap existing in that area. Also, long overdue attention should be given to put an end to the sexual violence and abuses which take place in the name of peacekeeping and which have been ignored, tolerated, and left unpunished for years by the United Nations itself. There should be no impunity whatsoever for the perpetrators of such acts. It would be pertinent if the head of the UN Women, the new entity that I mentioned, uh, which came into existence actually just one year ago in January 2011, to promote gender equality and empowerment of women, takes the lead in setting up a six monthly inclusive consultative process with civil society organizations at all levels and involving all relevant UN entities for the implementation of 1325. We should also encourage similar consultative process with civil society at the country level. We need to bear in mind that a gender responsive justice system is an integral element of effective peace processes and a necessary component of nation building activities in post-conflict situations. When women are able to participate in peace processes, the development of such a system, I mean the justice system, is one of the priority concerns they raise. They, such a justice system helps to break the continuing cycle of violence against women and ensures that meaningful participation, not only in peace negotiations, but also in rebuilding their communities and in transforming their societies. We have found that, say, I can recall the situation in Liberia. The women got together to ask the government that you have to set up a justice system which works, a police which respects the equality, respects the rule of law effectively. As my personal, to wind up, I should say that when I found that the UN system, because of the intergovernmental nature of its work, was very slow in adapting a, a, a set of uh, indicators to follow the implementation of 1325. I launched at a meeting on 1325 at the US Institute of Peace in Washington DC in July 2010. My own proposal, which I entitled Doable Fast Track Indicators for Realizing the 1325 Promise into Reality, outlining measures that could be initiated without further delays. At this point, it is a special pleasure for me to share with you the comments by the US Secretary of State, Ms. Hillary Clinton, who has been a great champion of 1325. About the US national plan that was launched last December. So US is one of those 34 countries which completed its national plan. And she launched it last December. In a meeting with women leaders in Germany recently, actually earlier this month, she said, and I will quote, a little long quote, but worthwhile. She said, it was essential that we have a comprehensive roadmap for accelerating and institutionalizing efforts across the US government to advance women's participation in making and keeping peace. And the National Action Plan represents a fundamentally different way for the United States to do business. It is really trying to lay out a new approach in our diplomatic, military, and development support to women in areas of conflict and to ensure that their perspectives and that considerations of gender 
are always part of how the United States approaches peace processes, conflict prevention, the protection of civilians, and humanitarian assistance." End of quote. Resolution 1325 belongs to humanity. It is owned by us all, and it is for the benefit of all. It was intended as such since March 2000, when the conceptual breakthrough was made. Therefore, on the occasion of the 10th anniversary at the Peace Gathering of Civil Society in New York on the 25th of October 2010, it was a spiritual and inspiring moment for me to declare 1325 a common heritage of humanity, wherein the global objectives of peace, equality, and development are reflected in a uniquely, hist uniquely historic universal document of the United Nations. Sustainable peace is inseparable from gender equality. We should never forget that when women are marginalized, there is little chance for the world to get sustainable peace in the real sense. Thank you.